Philip, Jan, and Alex were good friends who spent their summer days playing in the woods behind their homes and in an old ballpark which had now been long overgrown with vegetation. One of their favorite games was hide-and-seek. Their games often took hours because there were so many great places to hide in the now decaying park. So many, in fact, that often the players had to come out of their hiding places before it got dark. This day, however, only Philip and Alex showed up at the field. Where is Jan? asked Philip. I don't know, said Alex. The boys walked to Jan's house to see what was keeping her. What's wrong, Jan? asked Philip. Are you sick or something? Jan looked a bit hesitant. I'm not going to play with you guys at that old ballpark any more, she said. We can play here if you'd like, or at one of your houses. The two boys looked amazed. But that is the best place to play, the boy said. You know that, Jan. Jan began to look afraid now. I'm not going, she shouted. Not any more. Let's go without her, said Alex. We don't need her. We can play just the two of us. But Philip knew it would be much harder to play hide-and-seek with only two people, especially back in that old ballpark. "'Why won't you come with us?' Philip asked. "'Well,' she said, "'my grandpa was telling me about Chavis Cravis.' "'Who's Chavis Cravis?' Philip asked. "'Grandpa said, "'There used to be an old hermit who lived on the outskirts of town when he was a boy, named Chavis Cravis.' He said the hermit used to come into town and offer chestnuts to children. If they accepted, then he would take them back to his house in the woods and do unspeakable things to them. Grandpa said that once the townspeople found that out, they found Chavis Cravis and they killed him. Then they tore his house down and buried him in the rubble. Grandpa remembers his parents talking about how the remains of children were found all over the hermit's house. He had saved their bones to use as tools and utensils. He used their skin as clothes and furniture, and he had wigs made out of their hair. They even found some kids still alive, trapped in cages, emaciated and half dead. When our parents were young, they were told that if they misbehaved, then Chavis Cravis might come, and their parents could give them to him. Alex was smiling in amusement. So? he asked. Jan looked at him sternly. Grandpa told me to stay far away from that old ball field, because that is near where Chavis Cravis used to live. Your grandpa's just crazy, Alex said. Everyone knows that, and you're a baby for believing him. Fine, she said, but I'm not going. Good, said Alex. Let's go, Philip. But Philip didn't move right away, and he looked pale. But Alex grabbed him by the arm, and the two boys went to the ballpark. By the time the sun was setting that day, the two boys were having such a fun time playing hide-and-seek that they had completely forgot about what Jan had told them about the old hermit who once lived there. "'Let's play one more time before going home,' Alex said. "'Sure,' said Philip. "'I'll hide so well this time, you'll never find me.' So Alex started counting, and Philip ran to find a place to hide. Some time passed, and Alex still had not found Philip's hiding place. He looked in all the usual places, but Philip wasn't there. After a while it began to get dark, and Alex started calling to Philip to come out. It was time to leave. But Philip didn't answer. Soon the sun was almost down, and Alex began to feel frightened. The trees and rocks took on different forms in the darkness, and the ball field began to feel foreign to him. At the top of his lungs he called out again as loud as he could, but there was still no answer from Philip. Finally, Alex decided that Philip was not here, and he turned to run home, but instead ran right smack into a man who had been standing right behind him. The man grabbed his arm with scaly, bony fingers. Alex stared into the man's eerie face in horror. The man smiled. I have a chestnut for you, boy. Come with me to my house. I have many more for you. Alex ah! screamed and broke free of the man's grasp. 
He then ran as fast as his lungs could manage all the way home, never looking back. Some years have passed and neither Alex or Jan ever returned to that old ballpark near the woods. And Philip has never been found. It was one of the hottest summers to hit the small town of Greenville in years, with temperatures reaching over 100 degrees. Each day, the local swimming pool would be overflowing with neighborhood kids, desperately seeking an escape from the monstrous heat. There were so many kids, in fact, that the lifeguards had to turn many away because there just wasn't enough room in the pool for all of them. One day, two friends, Gilda and Olivia, were waiting at the park for their third friend Zoe to arrive. Let's just go to the pool now, Gilda said. If she doesn't get here soon, then none of us will get in. Olivia looked towards the road, hoping to see her friend, but Zoe was nowhere to be seen. Olivia let out a sigh. She's always late. Okay, said Gilda. We've waited for her long enough. Let's just go swimming. If she can't get into the pool, then it's her problem. The two girls walked over to the pool entrance, but were stopped by the lifeguard. Sorry, girls, he said. The pool is filled for today. You'll have to come back tomorrow. Gilda and Olivia looked disheartened. Please, it's only the two of us, Gilda said. Sorry, said the lifeguard. What about just me, then? She said. Hey, Olivia shouted, looking at her friend with disgust. Nope, said the lifeguard. Gilda turned and pouted off with Olivia right behind. As they reached the road, they noticed Zoe sitting on a rock waiting for them. Where were you two? she asked. We tried to get in to go swimming, but thanks to you, we waited too long and now can't get in. You went in without me? Sure did. Zoe stood up and pushed Gilda to the ground. Gilda let out a cry of surprise and she hit the ground, but was quickly on her feet and going after Zoe. Olivia quickly got between the two furious girls and held them back. Hold on, she said. I know another place. A better place. What place? Gilda asked, still furious. There's a lake. It's a few miles away from here, but it's worth it. My brothers took me back there last year when they were teaching me how to hunt. What lake? asked Zoe. Just trust me. It's there, okay? The walk isn't that bad. We can bring some drinks and it's worth it. So the three girls went home to pack some drinks and snacks and then set out for the lake. They ventured through the woods down an old path for some time before Gilda stopped them. Okay, Olivia, we've been walking now for almost an hour. Do you really know where you're going? Olivia turned around. Of course I do. We can't miss it because there's a huge clearing right before the lake. We're close now, trust me. They continued walking for another twenty minutes and then reached the clearing. Suddenly, Zoe began to feel uneasy. What's the matter with you? asked Gilda. Zoe turned and looked towards Olivia. My parents told me about this place. How a boy disappeared here twenty years ago. Olivia looked annoyed. So? So what? He was playing hide and seek with his friend and just vanished. Olivia smiled and walked over to Zoe. That was twenty years ago. What's the matter with you? I didn't know we were coming here. Don't you know about Shavis Cravis? The other two girls began howling with laughter. Oh my god, said Gilda. How old are you? That old hermit is just a fairy tale that parents tell little children so they don't come back here. Zoe began to get angry and walked over to Gilda. Oh yeah? And why would they do that? I don't know. Adults never want kids to go to neat places by themselves. Adults are just superstitious like that. Look, Olivia broke in. The lake is just behind this field, so you can either come along with us or walk back home. It's your choice. Zoe thought about it for a few seconds, then began walking forward ahead of the others. Well, are you coming? She called back. About 15 minutes later, they were at the lake. The three girls immediately dropped their belongings and ran over to the fresh, cool water, diving in with glee. Wow, Gilda shouted. This is so much better than that crowded old swimming pool. 
We have our own beautiful lake all to ourselves. You certainly did good, Olivia. Olivia and Zoe smiled and the three girls began splashing each other with the water. Several hours passed and the sun began to set. Maybe we should head back, said Olivia. It's going to be dark soon. Gilda thought for a moment. Now let's sleep here, she said. The other two girls looked surprised. Think about it, you two. We can wake up bright and early tomorrow morning and go swimming again, then walk back home at lunchtime. That's stupid, Zoe shouted. My parents don't even know where I am. They would be horrified to know I was here. Gilda looked over at Zoe with a condescending smile. You're just worried that the boogeyman is going to come tonight and take you away, aren't you? I'm not afraid of the boogeyman, but there could be real dangers out here. What about real crazy people that might pass through here at night? Or wild animals? She might have a point, Olivia said. Gilda thought about it for a moment and then smiled. I think it's too late to go back now anyway. We have a long walk back and when it gets dark we'll get lost in the woods. So really, we don't have a choice in the matter. The other two girls weren't happy, but conceded to Gilda's point. After that, they got out of the lake and dried off. Then they laid down under a large chestnut tree and watched the sky grow darker. You can see a lot more stars back here, huh? said Olivia. Yes. The three girls jumped up to see a dark, gaunt-looking man standing under the chestnut tree. Who are you? asked Gilda. The man simply turned and looked at her, saying nothing. He bent down and picked up a chestnut. I like to pick up chestnuts, I find. I take home and roast them. Eat them. Very good to eat. You can come home with me. We will roast chestnuts and eat. No thanks, she said. The haggard man turned to the other two girls. You there? Come and eat at my house? Eat chestnuts? Olivia and Zoe were frozen with fear. Then Gilda walked up to the man, the other two girls shaking their heads but saying nothing. Are you Shavis Cravis? She asked him. My name is Shavis Cravis? Oh really? Because Shavis Cravis is dead. He's been dead a long time now, so how can you be him? Do you want me to tell the police about you? Is that what you want? She turned to look at her two friends who were now slowly backing away. Shavis Cravis is dead. It hurts to be dead. Can't eat chestnuts when dead. Can't eat anything good when dead. Can't breathe when dead. It hurts terribly to be dead. Then suddenly the man's form began to change. His skin began to deteriorate and putrefy before their eyes. Olivia and Zoe screamed and took off running, and Gilda just stood frozen in fear and disgust. Then the man, if he was still or ever had been a man, looked up at Gilda with dead eyes. He spoke now with a voice from the grave. What be dead, never stop Shavis Gravis from harming children. Nothing. Ever stop Shavis Cravis from that? Gilda screamed and finally found enough strength to turn and run, but was grabbed by a bony claw. You will stay with me, girl. You will stay with Shavis Cravis and eat chestnuts for him. Cravis will eat you. 
Gilda screamed in absolute terror and cried out in desperation, struggling to escape the thing's icy grip. The horrid creature sank down into the dirt beneath the chestnut tree, dragging Gilda along with it until it and the girl were completely sucked down into the darkness of the earth. In the days to follow, the police and townspeople searched desperately to find the missing girl, and then later to find her remains. But nothing was ever found of Gilda, or of the frightening thing that had taken her. <laughs>